Fortunately, the U.S. didn't get much traction at that meeting and only got supported by about three countries out of 50 that participated, and we hope that that can go away very soon. When RBGH was approved, Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, who later became Monsanto's vice president, was in charge. So it got approved with very little testing and no labeling requirements. In fact, Taylor wrote a white paper suggesting that if any dairies want to label their products as free from RBGH, he suggested that they also include a disclaimer that says, according to the FDA, there's no difference between milk from cows supplemented with RBGH and those not supplemented. Now, this was a recommendation. It wasn't a requirement. But as soon as companies started to actually say RBGH free on their labels, Monsanto came in and sued them. And now companies are putting that disclaimer on there to, to meet Monsanto's very unlegal and inappropriate requirements. But then Monsanto got some states to actually implement a requirement that dairies put that disclaimer on there. In fact, Ohio right now has a horrible law which, has, which specifies the font size and the location of the disclaimer in such a horrible way that some companies are saying that they'd rather take the RBGH free claim altogether off of their milk carton as a, uh, rather than having to fulfill that requirement. And that means any national brand that's sold in Ohio has that problem. So it really is a problem. We're actually trying to convince the governor of Ohio to change his mind immediately so we don't lose the traction that we've gained all these years. The junk food eating couch potato in America does not know that he or she is eating GMOs and will never know that we got rid of it for them. Because it only takes a small percentage to reject GMOs in the marketplace. We don't need to inform everyone. In fact, there are so many people receptive to our message, we can get rid of GMOs without having to convince anyone who is resistant. There is, in fact, an economic divide between those that can afford organic and those that can't. Those in inner cities don't have access to fresh vegetables and fruits very often. But as far as GMOs go, I'm optimistic that we can get rid of them so quickly that it won't be a problem for very long. Of all of the toxins that are released into the environment, GMOs are of a special class. You see, with genetic engineering, you have pollution of the gene pool. It's a self-propagating genetic pollution. The genes that we released in this generation already can outlast nuclear waste. They can go on forever. We have no technology to fully clean up this type of pollution. Certainly, we can reduce it dramatically. But until we have some technique to identify GMOs at a distance, we are stuck with GMOs possibly forever. Imagine being hired by a company that says, we have a little problem. We'd like you to organize the recall of our salmon from the ocean. There's a company that wants to introduce genetically modified mosquitoes. Imagine trying to do a recall there. GM pollen has already contaminated the indigenous corn varieties of Mexico, and we have no technology to clean that up. What we've done is irreversible damage, and this is something that is highly irresponsible, unconscionable. And it was done over the objections of scientists, over the objections of science, a collusion between government and industry. If you look back at the records of what actually happened at the FDA in 1991 and 92, the scientists were very clear. They said GMOs could create higher levels of existing toxins, new toxins. They might bioaccumulate toxins from the environment. They might produce allergies or new diseases or nutritional problems. They said the process of genetic engineering is different and leads to different risks. So what did the government say? The government said, we know of no significant differences. We know of no significant risks. Completely lying about what actually was said within the department. The first genetically modified crop to be reviewed by the FDA was the Flavor Saver tomato engineered for longer shelf life. And that was the only company that actually gave raw feeding study data to the FDA to evaluate. It turns out the rats refused to eat the tomato. Now, this is not uncommon. In fact, eyewitness reports from all over North America and around the world show that a variety of animals, when given a choice, avoid eating GMOs. Cows, pigs, squirrels, geese, elk, deer, raccoons, mice, rats, chickens, and buffaloes. 
So it's my job to get humans up to the level of animals. When they force fed the rats, the tomatoes, seven of 20 developed stomach lesions, seven of 40 died within two weeks. Now, if you look at the data that was recovered from a lawsuit from within the FDA, they're clear that there were unanswered questions related to safety and that the tomatoes did not meet their normal standard of reasonable certainty of no harm. But the political appointees did not put up any red flag to block the tomatoes. In fact, they said that the tomatoes passed with such flying colors that no subsequent GM application is going to even require the level of evaluation that the tomatoes had. From that point on, it was purely a voluntary consultation process where the companies can choose if they wanted to even talk to the FDA, and they could determine what data, if any, they were to turn over to the FDA. And it's always been summary data, not enough to properly evaluate safety. If the reviewers want more information and ask for it, they're typically ignored. And at the end of the exercise, they write a letter. For example, a letter to Monsanto which says, Monsanto believes its foods are safe and, and understands it's its responsibility to make that determination. So the FDA has no further questions. The FDA does not even approve GM crops. They let the companies do it themselves. When you look at the actual research that's done by the companies, they have rigged their research to avoid finding problems. Even very serious problems, even deaths of animals, are dismissed as not statistically significant or not biologically significant or not treatment related without scientific justification. I've analyzed with many, many scientists around the world how these biotech companies have bad science down to a science. They use the wrong controls, the wrong detection methods, the wrong statistics, the wrong reporting protocols. It's absolutely horrendous. I'll give you some examples. When Monsanto wanted to pretend that injecting cows with bovine growth hormone did not interfere with the fertility of cows, stolen documents from the FDA made public revealed that they apparently added cows secretly to the study that were pregnant before injection. When researchers wanted to prove that pasteurization destroys bovine growth hormone in milk, they pasteurized the milk 120 times longer than normal. They only destroyed 19% of it. So they added powdered hormone to the milk at huge volumes and then heated it 120 times longer than normal. And only under that rigged condition did they destroy 90% of the hormone. But that's what the FDA reported, that pasteurization destroys 90% of the hormone. That's just an example of what we read over and over again. And it's, sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's very, very blatant lies and misinformation. Because GMOs are not labeled, it's hard to file a lawsuit, because it's hard to trace back who's eating GMOs and who's not. So it's one of the ways that the biotech industry protects itself by not letting us know what is GMO and what is not. I've talked to some former Monsanto employees and got quite an interesting insight into the company. One scientist told me that his colleagues were doing safety studies on milk from cows injected with their bovine growth hormone. When they saw how much IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, was in the milk, these three scientists refused to drink milk again unless it was organic. He also told me that there was a study that showed problems with rodents that were fed one of Monsanto's GM crops. So instead of withdrawing the crops, they decided to rewrite the study to make it look less of an adverse finding. A former salesman for Monsanto took the job because he was so impressed by the words of former CEO Robert Shapiro, who claimed that GMOs would help the world. And so when the employee orientation meeting happened in St. Louis, this man, Kirk Azevedo, stood up and described all these great things that Robert Shapiro had said. After the meeting, a vice president pulled him aside and said, wait a minute. What Robert Shapiro says is one thing, what we do is something else. We're here to make money, we don't even know what he's talking about. The FDA has proven to be a regulatory agency that has been hijacked by industry, both on the drug side and the food side. Many of the people that approved bovine growth hormone either worked for Monsanto directly or indirectly, and one person actually did research for Monsanto and then took over the department that evaluated her own research. As far as what we need, we need an independent body to do evaluate the safety of GMOs. We need generations of evaluating GMOs before they're put onto the market. You see, we're just babes in the woods 
in our understanding about the DNA. And we're making fundamental changes in area that we have very little understanding of. We redefine what a gene is, how a DNA functions every few months. And yet the science behind the genetic engineering of food is based on assumptions that have already been proven wrong 30 years ago. So we're in a situation right now where industry has pulled the wool, has pulled the wool over the eyes of the public and has millions of people that they support within the agricultural industry and with the academic side and of course within government that keep pushing the same myths. They give the myth that it's safe, that it's been proven safe, that it's precise technology, that it'll feed the world, that it's needed and that it's here to stay. All of those things are false. In fact, it's a very dangerous technology fraught with unpredicted side effects. It hasn't been proven safe. In fact, the industry research is rigged to avoid finding problems. And the FDA doesn't require a single piece of, of research for safety. It's unreliable. It can easily be withdrawn in terms of, well, it can be, it can be stopped, but it won't be 100% withdrawn from the genetic pollution. But we can do a good job there, too. Henry Miller used to work for the FDA and said to the New York Times that Big Ag has gotten everything they have asked or told the regulatory agencies to do. And that's the way it is. Big Ag, big corporations, there's, it's hard to define where corporations end and where the government starts. There's a connection there which is extremely unhealthy and can have long-term consequences and already has long-term consequences. And GMOs are one of the most serious because it affects everyone who eats and all future generations and the entire ecosystem. What you see in genetic engineering is a pattern which is prevalent throughout the government where corporations have influenced the regulations over, the, over themselves in such a way that they, have given, they were given free reign to make big bucks without consideration for health and environmental consequences. And fortunately, from the side of GM food, it is easier to stop than the other major problems. It's easier to stop than problems that require policy change because we can do it from the side of the market. Because people vote with their forks, they vote with their dollars, we can have a revolution in the kitchen. And that's what we're focused on. We realize, you know, I have a small NGO, small nonprofit organization. How can I go against the millions upon millions that Monsanto spends to lobby Washington, to buy and pay for elections, etc.? We can't. But we can go to consumers who are concerned about their health, to health conscious shoppers, to parents of young kids, to doctors and their patients, to the general public where they're concerned about what they put in their mouths and the mouths of their families, and give them accurate defensible information about why GMOs are unhealthy and why we shouldn't eat GMOs at all. And then give them a shopping guide, how to avoid eating GMOs. This, these are the tools to affect policy at this point, greater than lobbyists, greater than money for, for campaigns, because this is the tool that will get the food companies to kick out GMOs when they become a marketing liability. Years ago, they called 98% of the DNA junk genes because they didn't code for proteins they figured they were just a refuse pile of previously accumulated genetic material now they realize oh it's very important they used to think that genes could be sorted and, and, and moved in any direction and anywhere on the genome because they acted independently now they realize that there are families of genes that work together as a network they used to think that one gene produced one protein produced one trait that's false so what we have here is an evolving understanding of the most fundamental level of biology. And yet the technology of genetic engineering is based largely on the false assumptions. Now, the fact that one gene does not produce one protein producing one trait in almost every case is why they've limited their genetic engineering to basically two traits, poison, poison drinking and poison production. They can't easily create drought tolerance or salt tolerance or higher yields because that involves a family of genes and a network of genes that we don't understand the language that they're speaking. But there's an arrogance that we can just go in there and try things and put it on the market without actually even testing the safety of the products that they're creating on animals or humans.